closing stretch, and I know that there's a couple of folks in the very back there that are checking their phones. I see your face lit up. If you need to get up and stretch, I understand we're almost through, and I promise there's no weird venereal disease photos in my presentation. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. Maybe I just snuck one in. Um, okay, so we've, we've talked a little bit uh, today. I'm going to not have this in my hand. Just in case. Um, so today we're going back to 1938. So we're going, I'm sorry? Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're very on trend right now. <laughs> um, uh, before the Cold War, before the Korean War, before the US even entered World War II, before we had computers in our pockets, which I think I forgot to turn off. No, we're good. Um, before televisions were in every home, back when having a radio in your living room was the height of mass media entertainment. Previously used for military purposes during World War I, radio had started catching on commercially in the 1920s, and even though the Great Depression was happening, purchases of in-home radios continued to go up due to lowering prices and just basic curiosity with this great new technology. Uh, in response to this, the Federal Radio Commission, which was the predecessor of the Federal Communications Commission, was created in 1926 to regulate the new medium. And then the Communications Act in 34 came through, which kind of kicked up. Okay, well, none of us are here to talk about the FCC tonight. So, <laughs> um, so really, I picked this topic to try and do my 1930s radio voice. <laughs> no, I can't do it. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin. That was okay, guys. <laughs> Thanks, hey, assholes. Um, so let's put ourselves in the shoes of a 1938 American. War is breaking out around the world, and your country is still um, pulling itself out of one of the greatest financial calamities it had ever seen. You have a radio in your home, which you and your family now gather around on a regular basis for your news and your entertainment. And one night you sit down and you click on the Columbia Broadcasting System, eager to sit in for a night of, of listening and fun. And so when you sit down, you happen upon a delightful show of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. They're in the middle of a song, and as the big band swings, you're suddenly interrupted by a special news bulletin. And then the band continues to be interrupted by special news bulletins of increasing concern. And what begins as weather alerts then becomes a Princeton professor describing the crash landing of a cylindrical object 30 yards in diameter in a field near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. And your ears perk up at this point. Perhaps you live nearby in Pennsylvania or you're listening from New York City. You hear the newscaster, the, the, the very reputable Carl Phillips, you think you've heard of him at this point, describe in real time that the object is not a meteor, but it is not of this earth. So soon, Phillips is speaking with farmers on whose land the object crashed, and perhaps at this point you gather your family around the radio, shushing your husband to be quiet, because this is important, as Phillips pushes his way to the front of the crowd, an uncanny hum emanating from beneath the object's smooth surface. You hear the panic in the crowd grow, and Phillips begins yelling. His voice is hoarse with fear, and then you hear an explosion. Philip says the whole wood's on fire, growing closer, only 20 feet away, and then his feed goes dead. And then there's silence, followed by a hastily put together message from the radio company, then a cut to the dulcet tones of Chopin for some reason, cut in again, and it becomes very clear to you that many are dead. And you know what, maybe you panic. Maybe you call your local police force in tears. Maybe you run for your local church, bursting forth into an evening service, proclaiming that, yes, it is true, there are invaders from another planet. I heard it on the radio. And as the Washington Post reported the next day, maybe, quote, federal, state, and municipal officials were hard put to it calming frightened thousands at police headquarters here in every precinct, in offices of the park police, morning newspapers and station WSJV, switchboards blazed with insistent lights. Terrified, tearful voices asked, what's it all about? Is it safe to stay here? Have they called the army, the navy, the marines? For an hour, hysterical pandemonium gripped the nation's capital and the nation itself. The title of the article was Monsters of Mars on a Meteor Stampede, Radio Radiotic America. But guess what? It was a fucking radio play put on these, by these guys. 
please meet Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on air. And you know what? Maybe you're, oh yeah, there we go. That was, I was waiting for the laugh on that. Um, those fucking guys. And they were doing a radio play based on a turn of a century classic, The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, no relation. Suddenly it became clear that this mass panic that you experienced with your family and your neighbors and your clergy was all for naught, spurred on by a bunch of 20 something thespians putting on a science fiction radio show. <laughs> Theater, no? Okay. So, we're gonna go through some headlines from the next day, and these are real. Headlines the next morning scream bloody murder over the panic caused by the radio play. Across the world, literally all the way to Australia, newspapers led with the story of the Martian invasion hoax, which so caught fire that it caused mass panic across the eastern seaboard. It leads every paper. Two real radio drama gives nation bad case of war jitters. Especially in New York, obviously. If you've listened to it, you know that it ends with a very famous uh, scene in New York City. Um, headlines are screaming of terror and panic, and the issue is dominating all news everywhere. Yeah, so, so look, this is the New York Times, listeners in panic, and there's just one other thing on this that's kind of being like pushed to the side. I don't know if we should be paying attention to the ousted Jews in Poland. I don't, it's a little thing. There was a radio panic. Cool, 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 cool. And also, all the way up in Canada, my, my homeland, uh, you can, s <laughs> yes, Canada. Ottawa seeks to ban, and Ottawa's the capital of Canada, if you don't know that, but Ottawa seeks to ban radio horrors. And again, another little thing, just that Slavs are swallowing up Britishers, and there's a little bit of fear of the other. Anyway, that was also very cool, 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 cool. So over 1,700 letters were written to the FCC, many expressing their absolute displeasure and anger. And Wells and his merry band of pranksters had to pull themselves together to conduct a near tearful press conference, throwing themselves at the mercy of real Americans. Look at the concern in his forehead creases. <laughs> Look at them. That's concern, theater. <laughs> That's gonna be a thing. Theater is a thing. And this, this actually was looked at by some academics. The mental and spiritual damage was measured. A later study con uh, conducted by Princeton psychologist uh, Hadley Cantrill, The Invasion from Mars, A Study in the Psychology of Panic, finds that, quote, people did panic and some of them ran for the hills, unquote. He said that six million people listened to it and found that one million of those listeners, quote, were frightened or disturbed. And then this story of radio-induced panic kind of settled into the zeitgeist and became something that we pass on every year about radio causing panic and how we have to be very careful with our listeners and our readers because we hold their sanity in our little hands. I say our, I'm not a journalist, but holding it in their hands. But hey guys, did it actually happen? Before we discuss this though, we're also gonna go back to the CDC because I am not a scientific person. And so when I decided I wanted to discuss an outbreak, I, I wanted to talk about this because I first got into uh, talking about outbreaks and epidemics with resident odd salon geologist and heartthrob Miles Trayer, who is not here this evening. Um, that was my call out to him, but he's not here anyway. Um, but I'm not a scientist. I'm just someone who spends way too fucking much time looking at the internet and reading news. So. I thought I'd be clever. Let's look at how this radio thing impacted America and like tore us asunder. But to live up to the hallowed nerdery of Odd Salon, I, yeah, I needed to look at it through a scientific lens. Yes. I've never had any, anyone yell at that before. Anyway, so to do that, I did whatever a plucky 30-something person who's losing her microphone would do. I got it, I got it. Theater. Um, a plucky 30 something non technical person would do. I Googled definition of an epidemic and I went to the CDC, which, by the way, is not a good thing to do if you're recovering from something. Don't spend too much time on the website because you know what? You're going to get on the current outbreak list and who boy, that's not a good, uh, it's not good for your mindset, especially if you're a woman of childbearing age and Zika's like everywhere and you can't. Just don't do it, hypothetically, of course, just don't do it. 
So we, we've kind of talked about this tonight. I'm not going to go into this. But it refers to an increase often sudden in the number of cases of a disease. So what do we, did we need for an epidemic here when it came to this radio play? Well, so we need a disease-carrying agent, either a new one or stronger one. The agent must be introduced into a new setting. There must be a more efficient mode of transmission, a change in host... A change in host susceptibility and increased exposure. So based on what we just talked about, we should have everything covered, right? The agent was the War of the Worlds show itself. The setting was a realistic drama new to radio that nobody knew about. The transport was the personal radios in people's homes. No one was su uh, suspecting a fake broadcast, so everyone was pretty susceptible to it, right? And listeners were, the other factors were listeners then sharing it with their circles. So I was going to make a graph and have things move, but I'm not very sciencey, so this is my shitty odd salon art. Yay! But seriously, did this actually happen? I've been a fellow with Odd Salon since the very beginning, and I've spoken on this stage many a time. Hasn't been for a while, but yeah. For the most part, though, I've been like a pinch hitter. I get brought in, as Trey mentions, you know, there's, there's a topic that needs to be discussed. I've got 48 hours. Let's talk about dinosaurs in the Victorian era. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to get back on the horse. So when um, Tamara opened up curation, I'd recently returned from a disinformation summit at Stanford, examining the role that internet amplified fake news had in impacting democracy around the world. So, you know, light stuff. So these hoaxes were on my mind. And so then I thought, hey, War of the Worlds, right? That's something that happened with media and panic. That's great. I'll just do a little bit of Googling and get to talking, and then I'll talk about other hoaxes, and they'll give me a microphone, and we'll talk about alien ships, and maybe people will yell about that too. Eh, a little, little delayed on that. Except it took like one JSTOR search to realize it was just full of shit. So did it happen? The answer is probably no. Uh, at least not in the way that we know it. Uh, in 2010, J. W. Joseph Campbell uh, reviewed the coverage of the panic in three dozen major newspapers and found that it was much more reported than actually occurred. Um, Secondhand and thirdhand information sharing actually led to more confusion than the people that actually listened to the broadcast itself, which makes sense because you trust the people in your life that that come running into your church and saying aliens are landing. And as he writes, quote, a false alarm contagion took hold in many places of the country, sowing fear and confusion among people who had heard not a word of the broadcast. But he found little evidence to suggest the mass panic that these headlines had conveyed. And another scholar actually said, quote, there was only scant anecdotal evidence existing of any panicked reaction. So why do we still believe it? Of course, we got to go to Snopes on this one. Oh, wait, Snore of the Worlds. Cool, cool, cool. Mostly false. Yeah, so they're right. So good, guys. Talk over. Thanks. Cool. Um, but we have to think about why this sort of grips into the national psyche. Why are we still talking about the War of the Worlds? Why is it still referenced in journalism classes? It's because it's an amazing story. The idea that a new medium had the power to enter the homes of millions and cause an outright panic is delicious. And because of the trusted sources those newspapers of the day reported it as true, it became a part of the lexicon. So let's look at this panic as a disease from another lens. What if the agent was the Associated Press story that influenced most of the headlines that ended up happening the next day? What if the setting is local papers relying on the wire because they don't have folks in uh, New York to be reporting this coverage? What if the transport was that head were, excuse me, what if the transport was the headlines across the country? What if papers really wanted to blame radio, and that's a whole other talk to go into, and just really wanted to shit on the new medium that was causing all of this panic and taking away their ad dollars? <laughs> and other factors? It's a damn good story to tell. So we're, I'm going to be quick on this, but there were a lot of factors, obviously. The country at this time in 1938 was ripe for invasion literature scenarios. So uh, invasion literature is, was from about, uh, I want to say, 1887 through 1914, right before World War I. The idea that the other is coming into your country and stealing your stuff and stealing your women and, and taking over. We don't know anything about those things right now. Um, so stories like the Battle of Door King, the War of the Worlds, as we talked about, the invasion of 1910, all stories centered on our world being infiltrated. And how is history made? Sorry, that was the wrong Google search. Um, I mean, it's a pretty good poster, right? I liked it. 
theater. Um, history is made by humans. History is made by humans. Algorithms are made by humans and others talk. Anyway, but history is made by humans. And they're looking for evidence and narratives to make sense of what's come before. And things have to fit into little packages. So naturally, the headlines compiled were what were included because that was the historical record that we had. And those stories germinated in that one Associated Press article, which was basically relied upon by everybody. And it started with, quote, hysteria among radio listeners throughout the nation and actual panicky evacuations. That became gospel, and that became the story. I, I just included this because I really like her shoes. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but there was a distrust of radio, and then there was one more thing, too. This fucking guy, Orson Welles, <laughs> he had that, that, he was so upset about his little, his little, what, all, all the problems that he had, and he felt so bad, and, and seriously, this fucking guy, guys. He brought all of this on. He built this into his own personal narrative. Thank you for reading. <laughs> I mean, I'll take it. Look, I probably would have dated him in high school. Let's just be honest on this one. Um, I shouldn't be shitting on him too much. But this became a part of the narrative. This was the radio broadcast that brought America to its knees. This is a cover of a reprint from, a, uh, uh, from one of the recordings that were, were sold. The original broadcast that panicked the nation. Okay, so why do we care? Why do we care about the fact that this didn't actually happen the way that it's currently referred to? Well, we care about things like this. Have you heard of the satanic panic of the 80s and 90s? <laughs> Satan. So these were much reported cases of ritual satanic abuse of children in daycares and homes. And some of you watch Criminal Minds as much as I do, so you know what I'm, I'm talking about. This is a period of time where people were afraid to send their kids to daycare. A couple was released in 2013 after spending 21 years in prison, convicted of sexual assaults, and accused of unspeakable acts involving devil worship against children. The Vancouver Sun, once again, Canada just sticking its fucking nose in this. Canada. Yeah, Canada. <laughs> Pro proclaimed in a headline, terror at the daycare. They were convicted after a six-day trial. Fran and Dan Keller spent 21 years of their lives behind bars, and a study by the National Center on Child Abuse and Neglect found that not, there was not a single substantiated case of cult sex abuse among more than 11,000 reported, not a single case. And they spent 21 years of their lives in prison. And now we live in the era of fake news, yay! Is this gonna work? Yeah. Where we're just getting distracted all the time. Where humans create fake but real looking websites with salacious headlines designed for us to click and share them. These are human beings that are developing this. And they're sneaking into our timelines and they're getting emailed to us by our aunts and uncles and they're being repeated in polite conversation even if we're just saying that it's bullshit. These are all from about November 3rd, 2016. These are headlines that Snopes felt that they had to debunk because they were getting passed around so much. Snopes has its work cut out for him right now, and good journalists and those that are doing the hard work to expose some of the lies and some of these machinations that are happening are working their ass off, but they have to fucking, they have to debunk this stuff. So, basically, I don't have a neat wrap up to this. There's nothing, there's nothing that neatly ties a bow on this. But just know that fake news just finds the medium. It finds the medium we're not used to. It finds the medium that we're susceptible to believing. And it takes over and it becomes a part of our lives. So what do we do? We inoculate against it. We teach people to read, read critically. We pay for good journalism. We pay for what we read. We, we get a fucking subscription to the Washington Post. Because if we don't have people spending time debunking this, we have now see that it's even easier than before to spread those lies easily and quickly and, and more permanently than before. And let's just not fucking attack journalists anymore either. Let's give them money, let's do better work. So let's raise a glass to debunking and to critical thinking.